Hi everyone, welcome to this year's inaugural speaker series. My name is Addison Martin and I am the graduate student coordinator. As a general overview for the flow of this program, we will hear from our speaker and then we'll move into a Q&A, which will then be followed by a social with refreshments up in the common studio upstairs. Uh, to claim attendance for this lecture for a class you might be in, you'll submit some student information into a platform called Slido, um, and that'll be after the Q&A following Kirsten's presentation. Um, we'll go over how to do that at the end. Um, all right. This afternoon, we have the special treat of hearing from an environmental sociologist focusing on federal land management, climate change, and the impacts of uh, of these on indigenous peoples and sovereignty within the United States. I'd like to acknowledge that, that as a land grant institution, Utah State University campuses and centers reside and operate on the territories of the eight tribes of Utah. Logan campus is situated on the Shivagoi, Shivagoi, Shivag Shivagoi, uh, which is the Willow Valley. These are the ancestral lands of the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation, where Shoshone people have stewarded the land uh, since time immemorial and continue to live today. We acknowledge that these lands carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. We affirm indigenous self-governance history, experiences, and resiliency of the native people who are still here today. Kirsten Vignetta is, could we switch, sorry. Yeah. Awesome. Kirsten Vignetta is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology here at Utah State University. Prior to her current position, Kirsten received her bachelor's degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in landscape architecture, um, and most recently has received both a master's and a PhD from the University of Oregon in environmental studies and policy. She's been carrying out community-based participatory research through tribal collaborations to honor indigenous epistemologies and advance indigenous sovereignty. She's also interested in projects that interrogate mainstream discourses of vulnerability and resilience in the context of climate change. She takes interest in the emerging framework of multi-species justice, uh, which recognizes the relationship between human and more than human oppression, seeking solutions that simultaneously achieve social and ecological justice. As shapers of the environment, landscape architects and planners have the opportunity to consider how design interventions and planning decisions promote or inhibit multi-species justice. Please welcome Kirsten Vignetta. All right. Um, thank you all for having me. Thank you to the department for inviting me um, and to everyone for attending this talk, although I understand part of it is a requirement. So good job fulfilling your requirements. Um, it's been a while since I've been surrounded by landscape architects, so I hope I can hang. Um, and I tried hard to think about, you know, what gets landscape architects going, what gets you all excited, and I thought that one way to really get your attention and keep you on your toes is to use a really cringy font. And so, you know, I've tried to recall back to my landscape architecture days. So this glorious chiller font is going to be accompanying us throughout the presentation. Um, so you're welcome. And I hope that will, you know, have its intended effect to keep you, to keep you alert. Okay, so as was mentioned, um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about designing for multi-species justice um, and what that means. You know, I'm no longer a landscape architect, so um, I've tried to kind of like bridge what I used to do with what I'm thinking about now in some of my um, research and uh, teaching. Um, and so, you know, I don't think anything I'm going to say today is going to like be um, completely transformative of what you already are doing if you're, you know, carrying out your landscape architecture tasks in a thoughtful way, but maybe it will reframe how you think of it, um, and that's my hope, although it is, you know, kind of a fringe topic even within my discipline of sociology, but it's something I feel passionately about. Um, and, and so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how I even got to this particular topic um, and why, I'm, why I think I've been invited to this space. Um, and so... Um, I think that at the core, we can thank my chaotic childhood for 
getting us to a point where I'm interested in multi-species justice. I moved around a lot, um, had kind of a chaotic family life, and so I was a kid that found solace in the outdoors and among other species, and so that kind of set me on a trajectory um, for caring for those types of things, and um, initially went to the University of Minnesota with the intent of becoming a veterinarian. And worked in animal research in an effort to um, get something on my resume that would look good for vet school and immediately realized that I was way too wimpy to watch animals suffer um, and uh, decided I needed to change tracks, right? And so what did I do? The really logical choice was to literally flip through the catalog of, uh, at the time, you know, hard copy catalog of the University of Minnesota and just see like what caught my eye. That's like how you decide your future. Um, and I was like, oh, what's this landscape architecture thing? Never heard of it. Um, and just kind of found out like at a very like basic level what it was. And I was like, okay, well, I like art and I like nature. So this is clearly the right track for me. And so I established that as my new major. Um, and then ended up transferring to the University of Wisconsin-Madison and um, got my landscape architecture uh, degree there with a focus on ecological restoration. I was like the only one in my cohort that did that track and most other folks were doing uh, more like urban and like high-end design type stuff. Um, and so uh, this is one of the, <laughs> going way back to one of my uh, projects from my capstone project, which actually was a tribal partnership. It was my first time as a settler working with a tribe to do this capstone project. It was um, with one of the Ojibwe tribes in Wisconsin, the St. Croix Ojibwe, and um, you know some of the tribal leaders um, reached out to my professor and said we would like for a student to do a capstone to kind of give us ideas for developing um, developing this new uh, unit within our reservation for elders where we're going to do green housing. And so that was my capstone project and my, my first time um, partnering in some way with a, a tribe, which would then influence what I did later on down the line when I went back to grad school. Um, and then afterwards, I worked for three years as a landscape architect in an ecological restoration firm in Wisconsin and then kind of got restless, as I tend to do, and decided that I wanted to go back to grad school um, to pursue a master's in environmental studies. So then I headed to Oregon um, and did that and then was a masochist and returned for a PhD. Um, and, but in, that, in the course of those two degrees of my graduate work, I got to work with, um, I was working as a graduate research assistant for a project called the Tribal Climate Change Project. Um, and through that, I then developed a research partnership with the Coquel Indian Tribe in southwestern Oregon um, and did a project with them for my thesis where we documented tribal concerns on climate change impacts on traditional cultural resources through photo voice, which is a combination of photography and storytelling. And then for my dissertation, my advisor was Kari Norgard, who is a sociologist that does a lot of work with the Kadu tribe. So she brought me into that fold, and I've been kind of working on and off with that tribe, which is in, situated in Northern California um, since 2016. And so those two collaborations were highly influential in how I see a sustainable future and also in how I kind of conceive of what is possible when we break down that uh, human nature divide and start to think of other species as sort of agents in the landscape that um, can be victims of oppression that is occurring for, because of various social forces. And miraculously, I got an assistant professorship, and here I am um, at USU. And then um, last year, I taught my first graduate course, uh, which was a course on multi-species justice. And one of the grad students in this department, Bailey Gwynn, was in that course. And she suggested that I be a speaker here today. Hence, here we are. So you're going to hear a little bit about multi-species justice. So what is it, right? What is multi-species justice? And you all have probably heard of environmental justice. Um, Certainly you've heard of social justice, right? And multi-species justice is kind of integrating um, social justice and ecological justice. Um, it's a, it's, it was a, a term first coined by Donna Haraway in 2008 in her book, When Species Meet. And it expands social and environmental justice frameworks to really encompass more than human species into those frameworks. And it also understands ecological and social systems as, um, you know, not separate entities, but as one, uh, and examines the intertwinements between human and more than human oppression and liberation. And we'll talk a little bit more about what this looks like in real life. 
So, um, for example, um, David Pello, who's actually a sociologist, and he advances a critical environmental justice theoretical framework. He talks about how social inequality and oppression in all forms intersect, and members of the more than human world are subjects of oppression and also agents of social change. Right? So not thinking of plants and animals and other beings as these sort of, you know, uh, puppets or, uh, you know, something we can mold to, you know, to our free will and not consider the implications of that, but as, you know, sentient beings that are agents and also that are victims of oppressive uh, systems. So multi-species justice gets its foundations from, it's kind of an amalgamation of a bunch of different ways of thinking and disciplines and fields. Um, and so Seller Major et al. talk about how it is kind of this blend of uh, animal rights, environmental justice, political ecology, which kind of thinks of the political dimensions of ecological systems, uh, post-humanism, and uh, especially, and in my case, you know, especially salient are indigenous knowledge and decolonial justice, given the work that I do with, with tribal partners. So what does this look like on the ground, right? What do I mean when I say that there is an intertwinement between social oppression and ecological impact? So, for example, we look, if we look at these snapshots of settler colonial violence, we, we quickly understand that indigenous dispossession did not just affect indigenous peoples, right? Here's a, a picture of children that have been sent to a boarding school away from their families and uh, attempted to be assimilated, uh, you know, their culture erased and assimilated into European culture and education. So, you know, not only do we have uh, genocide, displacement, assimilation of indigenous peoples, but we see that the species that are central to indigenous livelihoods and that have intimate relations with indigenous peoples also experience mass genocide, um, you know, at the hands of the settler colonial state, and that grassland ecosystems that are um, also intertwined with indigenous peoples and, say, buffalo, right? Those that, that's a pile of buffalo skulls, uh, also see a mass decline, right? So it's not just an impact upon indigenous peoples, it's an impact upon indigenous peoples and the species that are important to them and that they hold relationships with and, and the ecosystems that they interact with. Or for example here, right, um, we can look at industrial agriculture and see how its prioritization of cheap mass scale production and intense reliance on chemicals then leads to these parallel poisonings of not just Latino, you know, predominantly Latino farm workers, you know, a racialized workforce, but also, you know, quote unquote, weeds um, and insects and all the way on up the food chain, right? And so as a result, you see species experiencing health impacts and declines. And then compared with the general Latino population, farm workers are 59% more likely to develop certain types of leukemia, 69% more likely to develop stomach cancer, 63% more likely to develop cervical cancer and 68% more likely to develop uterine cancer. So you get a sense, right, that there is these multi-species impacts occurring because of, you know, mass agriculture and the reliance on chemicals. And then finally, to point out a more local example, um, you know, we see how uh, excessive water diversion by agriculture industry and private lawn irrigation, combined with the impacts of climate change, on, the, on Great Salt Lake are then compromising the livability of the Wasatch Front, not only for people, but also for more than humans, right? And so you see the desiccation of the Great Salt Lake as having serious consequences on the estimated 338 species that utilize the lake and its associated wetlands and uplands. Um, and in Salt Lake City, the impacts aren't equal, right? The west side of the city, which it has a higher percentage of people of color, um, is the part of the city that is projected to see some of the higher air pollution impacts um, should the Great Salt Lake, you know, continue to dry up. Um, you know, so these examples illustrate how unequal structures such as racism and, and settler colonialism intersect with speciesism and environmental exploitation to then create these ecosystem-wide multi-species impacts. So, you know, all this is relatively easy to understand in theory. The part where multi-species justice is kind of like at a 
at a standstill now and kind of like emerging is how do you apply it in practice, right? Um, so, uh, but and it def and it depends, right? And there's no right, no one way to really like apply a multi-species justice uh, framework. Uh, it, it is dependent upon a number of things. So one thing that it depends upon is the justice typology you use at, as the baseline. So justice is a term that gets thrown around, but uh, you know, for theorists that think about justice more concretely, there are different uh, typologies of justice, right? You can use a distributive justice, which says that environmental harms and benefits should be equally distributed, right? So if you're thinking of it in a multi-species context, there would be a relatively equal distribution of harms and benefits across uh, species and across different, you know, uh, social identities within human uh, social systems. Or you have, for example, restorative justice, which seeks to restore some, uh, you know, rest heal some sort of like historical wrong um, by making up for that, uh, you know, whatever um, infraction or violence was committed um, and so on and so forth, right? Or it doesn't even have to be one of these more, you know, academic typologies of justice. It could be um, something more simple than that. Like, you know, we want to restore, um, you know, these ecosystem relations in X site or whatnot. Or for example, it could be more culture specific, right? And a lot of indigenous um, cultures have their own set of, their own worldviews that come with their own set of ethics and values around multi-species relations and responsibilities to uh, the plants and animals, waterways, land um, that are within their ancestral territory. So it could, you know, be guided by that. So there's a number of ways you can approach it. Um, and then of course it varies based on the ecologies you're operating in and the scale at which you are working, right? Um, and finally the cultural landscape in which you are making and implementing decisions. And like justice pursuits broadly, multi-species justice is imperfect, right? Justice is not something that's like easily achieved. And even, you know, when you are achieving it uh, or you, you are pursuing it, there, it's never quite perfect. That doesn't mean it's not worthy of pursuit. Um, but some of the issues that arise when you're thinking of multi-species justice is um, a topic we talked a lot about in my multi-species justice class, which is ventriloquism, right? That's, that's a, a, you know, a puppet. In, you know, how do you speak for an animal, right? Or, or a plant for that matter. Um, and there's this risk of ventriloquism where you're just looking at it through your own human lens and we can never perfectly know, right, um, what another species needs, um, but there are ways to get close, right, uh, by relying on the knowledge of people that study that species or have had long, um, you know, multi-generational relationships with that species and have close interactions and know, you know, what the needs might be, what the behaviors are, what the habitat needs are, et cetera. But it, it still is an ongoing thing that you need to consider. Who counts, right? Like if you're thinking of a multi-species justice framework, and again, like you can't always encompass every single species on your site or in, you know, whatever context you're operating, but, you know, does the earthworm count as much as, I don't know, the gray blue heron, right? Like how do you make those decisions and how does, you know, how do they count in comparison to a fern? You know, so kind of coming up with um, decisions around how you're gonna, you know, make decisions um, and what's gonna, where you're gonna center value in your multi-species justice pursuit. And then, you know, what is justice in a world where we eat each other, right? Um, how do you, you know, it's not this like, peaceful kumbaya kind of like coexistence and nobody is going to, um, you know, we're just all going to die of starvation. Um, you have to, you know, recognize that there are ecological uh, roles and patterns and you have to honor that, right? So this quote from one of the central readings in our course, um, which is a book called The Promise of Multispecies Justice, mentions the following, you know, to kind of talking about this conundrum. In ecological communities filled with predators and prey, Hosts and parasites, worlds where hostility and hostages are embedded at the heart of hospitality, alliances can be fleeting as interests align, only to unravel again. According to Isabel Stangers, peace does not exist within ecological communities. Instead of longing for peace, she argues for the necessity of ongoing battles and sustaining conditions for life on Earth. So what is this to you, right, as a planner or landscape architect? 
And I would like to think that there, this should, um, that there's a lot, right? That um, could impact how you think of your work because you all make and remake place, which is a significant power, right? That comes, it's power that comes with responsibility. Um, and you organize how people and other beings interact with space and with each other. Um, and on top of it, for those of you that, you know, are going to be um, designing at the level of, um, you know, actually like planting design, etc., you are actually utilizing living beings as your design palette. And that comes with um, some considerations. Um, and you might be replacing some living beings on a site, right? Um, and certainly you're always operating in a given place with a given ecological and cultural history. And you have the technical skills to implement environmental remediation and restoration in a world that is rapidly collapsing and ha is facing a lot of issues on a social and ecological level, right? So this, this is, um, you, have, you hold the power to promote or inhibit multi-species justice with your plans and designs. So in the class that I taught, um, again, like this is an emerging um, framework. Uh, and in many senses, what, some of what we discovered as we navigated the class and the readings was that there's a lot still left up to, to interpretation and a lot of um, in, in uncertainty about how to apply multi-species justice framework on the ground, right, in practice. So these were kind of some central, very elemental, almost like, like childlike <laughs> steps that I decided were crucial um, in terms of, you know, how do you even get this started on the ground, right? And so we're going to go through these um, more in reference to how this relates to landscape architecture in particular um, in a second, but um, just to kind of give you a sense of the steps that um, emerged in our course that seemed central to kind of even getting something like this going. So the first step is to notice, um, notice especially the living beings around you at all times, right? Um, I like to ask sometimes in my classes for students to list 10 species they saw on the way to class. And most people can't list 10. Most people can, can't even list a specific species. They can maybe say tree or squirrel or plant or lawn, right? There is a problem. Uh, you know, the world, we're seeing like spe species extinctions and we are seeing a decline in our environments that are central to our living. And if you don't know something's there, you can't notice when it's gone. You can't notice when there is an impact that is irreversible. And certainly as landscape architects, it's crucial to kind of understand what is there already? Who are you going to put there that's new? You know, and what, you know, what is, you know, who, who's living in, in that space around you or, you know, in the sites that you are um, working in? And that's related to getting to know, right? So commit to a lifelong learning about the life ways and needs of living beings and communities in your midst. And that includes both human and more than human communities. And, you know, again, what I mentioned, the ethically learning from willing teachers who may know more than you about certain life ways, right? Whether it's an ecologist or a native person whose ancestors have lived in that space for since time immemorial, right? Or, you know, just a local person that has a lot of knowledge about a given species because maybe they're a hunter or a fisherman or whatnot. Somebody that's like, you know, rubbing those elbows with those species. Um, and then understand, and this is crucial, right, to the justice component of this um, particular framework, understanding the injustices that are shaping your biotic community or the community that you're operating in, right? And whether that be, um, you know, were there people displaced? Is there like mass uh, wealth inequity? Are there people in that community that um, can barely, are ma barely making enough income to survive in that space? Are, is there a history of racism, right? Um, uh, you know, the gamut. Um, and then how is that uh, reflecting uh, ecologically as well? And also this may change over time, right? So knowing 
these relationships once doesn't mean you know it forever, right? And so you have to like understand how contexts are shifting and a space that may have been equitable in the past is no longer and vice versa, or maybe the inequities look different. Um, you know, so un staying on task with that. Adopting a, a justice-oriented framework or goal that you can then, um, you know, develop your process based on. Uh, developing a process for making these just decisions, um, which involves, um, you know, it, it could look a number of ways. Like, you could have a uh, complex decision made matrix, right? Like a set of parameters that you and your team have developed. You could have some sort of decision-making council or interdisciplinary team, right? But something that you can make decisions based on the justice-oriented framework that you've chosen, right? Whether it's restorative justice, political non-ranking biocentrism is another one that we can talk about, um, you know, your family, community, tribes, uh, worldviews, right? Um, et cetera. Uh, and then implementing your process via a number of ways, right? In your case, it might be design, um, stewardship, planning, teaching, and, you know, in some cases, you might be able to do all of those as a landscape architect or planner, um, and then monitoring, reflecting, and revising. So let's look at what that looks like, you know, in the, in the realm of landscape architecture. And again, you know, this is something that I just started thinking about, so this is not like an uh, a comprehensive list, but just some ideas that I thought of uh, that might be particularly salient for you all. So, you know, if you're operating in a given site, who's there already, right? And notice I'm saying who, because like, um, you know, I think it's crucial that we start to think of other species as agents. Um, so who's there? People, plants, animals, um, right? Who should be there and isn't, right? So be it because of uh, habitat loss, climate change, um, you know, changing land uses, um, chemical, you know, the impacts of pesticides, uh, et cetera. Who is overrepresented, right? And, and this also, by the way, like, um, reflect is, you know, we should also think about human communities, right? Who's overrepresented? Who's underrepresented, right? Do certain people use the, like, are there people in the neighborhood that live there but aren't using this given site? And why aren't they, right? Like, what are the limitations there? Maybe the site's not accessible and someone in a wheelchair can't be there, right? But there's like, maybe there's an elderly community and they're not really using that space. Why is that happening, right? So thinking about who's overrepresented, um, who's underrepresented, who's thriving and who's not, right? And that can start to get your wheels turning in terms of how your design can mitigate some of these um, inequities. Get to know what is the history and ecology of this place, right? Um, what human cultures have shaped it? What and or who does this plant or animal need to thrive, right? Contrary to what a lot of Western conceptions tell us, some plants really do need people to be there, to harvest, to, like, to light fires, to you know, maintain habitats that are central to, and I'm not just talking ornamentals, I am talking wild species. You know, this like, idea that you need fortress conservation to protect species is being debunked by a lot of tribes and native folks and indigenous peoples around the world. Um, and so uh, another question, why is this plant invasive here, right? And approaching, like, you know, there's actually some really interesting studies and readings about um, the way, for example, indigenous peoples like um, Anishinaabe folks up in the Great Lakes areas are dealing with some inva invasive plant uh, issues in and around their tribal areas. And um, the way they approach an invasive is so different from what I learned, right? Which was just like garlic mustard, like you, you know, just like aggression and hatred, right? And how do we just exterminate this thing? And like thinking, you know, like about this species is like, well, this species belongs somewhere, right? And like, what is it doing here? And why did it arrive here? Like, maybe there was a site disturbance that really created the conditions for invasives to come in. How can you mitigate that, right? And also with climate change, like species might be migrating in various directions. So how do you think about species mobility and you know, think strategically and compassionately about how to um, foster, you know, a rich ecological community. 
And as I've mentioned, you know, ecologists, wildlife biologists, indigenous knowledge holders, local knowledge holders, historians, historically marginalized peoples and other species can serve as teachers, right, about what's going on in a site, what are the cultural and ecological dimensions. Understanding injustices. So is there a history of violence, oppression, or social inequality that defines the space? How has the space's ecology been transformed or exploited as a result of you know, social conflict, human conflict? Um, are there peoples, cultures, and or species that have been systematically marginalized, excluded, or erased? Are there historical multi-species relationships that have been severed? Are there forms of resistance that involve other species? And then once you've done that kind of reconnaissance, you can think right um, about what kind of justice framework or goals, you know, and this doesn't have to be terribly rigid. Um, and this is kind of the like, the, the trickiest part I would say about implementing this is like finding ways to implement such a system um, in ways that are um, operationalizable, <laughs> if you will. Um, but think of ways your design can remedy these inju injustices, right? And kind of restore biotic harmony and relationships that, you know, start to heal some historic wounds or, you know, restore health to certain parts of the community, create opportunities for, you know, community building across species and between people, etc. cetera. Um, you know, for example, intergenerational justice is a framework that gets utilized a lot in the context of climate change. So, this could possibly be achieved by creating climate adapted spaces for subsequent generations of both people and other species in the region, right? What does a climate refugia look like? How can your descendants and the descendants of pica, for example, um, have places where they can, you know, exist into the future? Um, and, you know, uh, generations of people and other species can uh, have their livelihoods uh, protected through your design. Restorative justice frameworks can guide designs that prioritize the healing of and reparations for eco-cultural wounds of the past, right? Um, and then, like I mentioned, the culture-specific frameworks that center multi-species well-being. And maybe your own communities have some sort of understanding of what these relationships look like and uh, what species are important. Like maybe there's keystone species that then lead to um, ecosystem-wide improvements, right? So maybe that's how you, um, you know, improve something by focusing on just a few species that are really central to ecosystem health. And then you develop a process for making these planning decisions, such as, you know, an interdisciplinary collaboration, right? You bring the design component to it, um, the technical construction skills, et cetera, et cetera, planning skills, um, and maybe other um, specialists or professionals bring you know, their knowledge um, and together you can make these decisions. Maybe there's a community-based sort of leadership situation where you ask community members or neighborhood association, right? You're designing a space in a certain context. You want that community to be engaged and, and convey their concerns and their interests. Um, cultural representation, right? So if you're designing a neighborhood, say in a predominantly Latino, uh, or designing say a park in a predominantly Latino community, you're gonna wanna make sure that that is a culturally appropriate, that those like cultural values are um, incorporated into the design if you really want it to resonate with and be utilized by the community in question. Um, if you're working with tribes, you're gonna to wanna to consult tribes and have them be a, every, a part of every step of the process, right? And really providing uh, that cultural knowledge. Um, Decision-making matrices, you know, and it kind of depends on the scale. Like maybe you're designing something small and you can maybe take into consideration multi-species justice and you don't necessarily need all this like community engagement, but you can kind of set some goals and kind of decide what, you know, your principal values are gonna to be to decide um, what's important ranking of priorities, experts who can advocate for other species, et cetera. Then you develop your plan or design, right? Guided by your justice-oriented framework, whatever you've chosen, or goals, and by the experts and communities that are engaged in project decision-making. 
you maybe are implementing, right? If you're a policy or if you're a planner, maybe part of this has to do with implementing policy that advances multi-species justice in some form or at least considers, right? I'm suspecting that if you were a planner and you're going to the like city hall and you're like, let's think about some multi-species justice, they're gonna be like, what? So, you know, maybe this looks a little different in how you word it, but you know, just really considering how humans and other species are interdependent and how you can create these, um, you know, beneficial plans and designs that restore health across like the ecological spectrum. Uh, generating justice-oriented conversations via interactive educational designs, um, deeply considering the needs of your living palette, right? You are working with living beings that have certain habitat needs, um, right? You also have the potential to utilize native plants um, and bring in and create habitat for a number of different species, right? So that's a, that's a powerful thing that you hold, you know, in your repertoire. So, you know, thinking of these plants not just as like, oh, it's purple and I want a purple plant right here. You know, like what is, what is this plant and what does it need? Um, and how does it contribute, right? And how does it maybe uh, restore a number of different, um, you know, important values to the, the site you're working in. And then striving not to compromise, you know, I was once a landscape architecture student, I know how tempting it is to like, you know, compromise functionality and practicality for a cool design, did that plenty of times. But, you know, strive not to compromise eco-cultural resilience and healing for the sake of a cool design, right? Like making it functional and um, thinking of its implications for your, you know, the neighborhood, the community, and, you know, the, the broader ecological context in which you're operating is central. And then like any good project, right? Monitoring, reflecting, and revising, returning to the space, and starting back up at one. Um, you know, who's here already? Who should be here and isn't? Like, who survived? Who hasn't? Is this plan working for this community? Are the species that I was hoping to um, attract here or, you know, um, foster here, are they doing well? Um, is the community using this in the way that I was hoping, et cetera? And how can it be improved or managed differently? You know, have we met our multi-species objectives? So to close, um, we're gonna come full circle to the first and only uh, one of these talk series presentations that I attended, which was Darren Perry's. I don't know if any of you were here last year for it, but, um, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with Uda Ogwa, which is a project happening um, just over the border in Idaho. Um, and so I think it's a regional project, that even though it doesn't like necessarily utilize the, the concept of multi-species justice, I think it's a regional project that really champions multi-species justice and illustrates a lot of these, um, Concepts, right? Um, so this is, for those of you that don't know, um, this is the Bear River Massacre site in Idaho um, with Northwestern Band of Shoshone Elder and former tribal chairman Darren Perry, um, who, you know, um, is standing here uh, on this site. Um, and it's part of the broader Shoshone territory, which um, Addison mentioned, This, you know, USU sits upon uh, Shoshone ancestral territory. Um, and in 2018, the tribe purchased the site of the Bear River Massacre. And at this site in 1863, more than 400 Shoshone people were massacred by settlers and volunteers led by the U.S. Cavalry, right? So this is a site with deep, deep scars for this tribal community. Um, you know, it's basically a burial ground and a site of great tragedy. So the tribe bought this. Um, with the aim of turning this ancestral landscape with, you know, these physical and metaphorical scars into a place of healing, restoration, and remembrance, right? And so part of the plan for Wuda Ogwa, which stands for uh, Bear River in Shoshone, is to restore the area as closely as possible to the natural habitat that existed before the massacre, right? So back when it was in Shoshone hands and managed traditionally. Um, and so it's a place that seeks, you know, seeks to begin healing the pain of colonial violence upon Shoshone people while si simultaneously restoring the ecosystems that have been altered and degraded by settler practices, um, including farming. And this effort will include planting of native species, restoring re riparian health, um, 
and also restoring vital keystone species like beaver, um, whose critical agency upon the landscape, right? That's a keystone species that's like a, you know, an ecological architect, um, your, you know, your counterpart in the non-human world. Um, and, you know, it has been deeply, one of the species that has been really deeply affected by settler colonialism. So, you know, if this project is unfamiliar to you, and I know, I, I think some of you have even done projects on this project, so it might be very, very familiar. But, you know, it's something that I encourage you all to find out more about and stay tuned because it's a very powerful example in a number of ways, including collaboration between the tribe and USU scientists. And also, in my opinion, an outstanding example of multi-species justice where you're simultaneously restoring um, you know, you're, um, you're healing a community and you're restoring the ecological integrity of that space per that community's uh, memory. Um, and also, from what, from what I hear, there's actually some upcoming um, volunteer opportunities um, at this site as well. I think on November 4th, there might be a mass planting of cottonwoods and I forget what other species. Um, but yeah, so if they're, you know, stay tuned and... Um, if any of you are interested in helping out, there are ways to possibly volunteer. So just to recap, um, there is a deep need to design for multi-species justice, in my opinion, because injustice is driven by things like racism, settler colonialism, class inequity, patriarchy, speciesism, the list goes on, simultaneously impact humans and ecosystems. And climate change is really exacerbating these injustices and driving extinction events, right? And creating these like, uh, unlivable conditions for both people and other species. And so as planners and landscape architects, you hold the power to create places that foster multi-species community and justice in which the intertwined well-being of humans, plants, animals, and ecosystems is understood and pursued via thoughtful, culturally relevant, and resilient design. And then I'll make a plug at the end here for a publication that my one of my students who I see is here, um, Zubair is in the back and he led um, the charge in compiling some of the works that unfolded from the multi-species justice graduate course that I taught in spring. And um, it's now available on this link um, and it uh, includes various pieces from different stu graduate students that were in the class and how they were grappling with this concept, right? And you'll see that it's not so simple, right? Like. Um, we all ran into hiccups about how to, you know, implement this and how applicable it was. Um, but uh, it also includes a, a multi-species justice reading list that features indigenous, black, feminist, queer, and Marxist multi-species scholarship to kind of give you a sense of how um, different identities and different scholars from different identities and disciplines are thinking about these things and framing these multi-species concerns. And with that, I will close. Thank you. There's that chair. Awesome. That was absolutely incredible. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to start opening it up to some questions. Um, so if you have a question, please raise your hand. Um, and obviously, this mic isn't amplifying. That's intentional. So just project if it's handed to you, <laughs> it's for the recording. Questions? We're just stunned. I know. <laughs> it's great. Um, I, yes, Jill. So I have a question. I'm not familiar with the, the tribe that's in the Bear River. They just, pro you said they purchased land recently and they're gonna restore it to how it was before. So how did they manage the land themselves, you know, centuries before settlers came in? Yeah, um, I'm just getting familiarized with the land management practices of the Northwestern Band of Shoshone, and I'm obviously not Shoshone myself, so I can't speak to it, but certainly there wasn't uh, intensive agriculture and like water diversion. For example, one of the things that I know are really central to the Wuda Ogwa um, restoration plan is restoring the riparian health of, of uh, a creek called Battle Creek that feeds into the Bear River, and a lot of that has been... Um, it has it receives a lot more sediment uh, and possibly also like chemical inputs from farmland around the area. So that would have been one central difference, right? That there wasn't these intensive farming practices. Um, there also is, from my understanding is that there was, uh, at the time there was buffalo in the area and there was some utilization. So like 
that would have had some, and I don't know if that's part of the plan necessarily. I don't think that they're aiming to restore Buffalo because that's a pretty substantial uh, endeavor that comes with a lot of, you know, controversy and complication. But, you know, those are all kind of like ecological changes or like say, you know, the removal of the beaver um, has its own implications for riparian systems. Um, so it was not so much that there were like, I'm sure there were some active practices unfolding, but a lot of what it is that is, I think, attempted to being restored is like less like restoring to a point where there wasn't so much human intervention into the like, you know, hydrology and into the lives of some, you know, keystone species. But yeah, it would be a question for um, Shoshone leaders to really be able to explain their own history and practices. And I'm less familiar with their practice. I've done a lot more work with the Kadoop tribe. I'm just starting to uh, interact with some, you know, with Darren and some of the other tribal leaders. So I'm less knowledgeable about Shoshone practices. Yes. Um, so I was wondering, um, I had two questions. So how would you suggest to find accurate history? And then, <laughs> because there's, you know, online gives us such great information. Um, and then my other question was like, when do you decide to pull back on your research? Because you have to get the job done. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, uh, I, I honestly, ha so let's, I'll start with the first question. I mean, I think uh, relying on multiple sources is helpful. Um, I mean, I think if you can get information directly from a given community, that's helpful. And then, you know, you could rely on historical accounts and maybe online is like not always the most reliable, although certainly there are reliable um, sources out there. But um, I think there is like always strength in asking locals, community members, tribal members, like whatever the context may be, right? Um, and, but then also backing it up maybe with your own research, right? Is there a book uh, of the history of the town or is, or of the neighborhood or whatnot? And there may or may not be, right? But I think like relying on multiple sources, you can kind of triangulate and figure out, well, you know, cause some parts of history aren't written in the books, right? And so kind of compensating for that by asking community members about their memories or their understandings and then supplementing that with literature um, you know, and kind of seeing, trying to paint a comprehensive picture in that way. Uh, but then of course, you know, if you're responding to a specific neighborhood or community, you're going to want to maybe like put press, pre, uh, you know, the most weight on their opinion, if they're going to be the users of the site, right? So you want it to reflect their needs and values. And then in terms of research and how to decide when it's time to dial back, I haven't, Multi-species justice is um, kind of like an emerging interest of mine, and I haven't actually like actively utilized that term in my research. Um, although a lot of the work I've done with the Kadoop tribe certainly um, encompasses these topics, right? And so, um, like I've worked with the tribe on, um, I was part of the team that developed their vulnerability assessment to climate change. Um, in their case, the Kadoop tribe in Northern California historically had utilized fire like in many, many ways for ecosystem management. And then the Forest Service now owns or has jurisdiction over a million acres of Kadoop ancestral territory and it's mostly managed via fire suppression. So that's been problematic in terms of um, you know, the representation and patchwork of the ecosystems that are central to um, tribal um, subsistence practices that really need that fire to keep, for example, open um, patches for oaks to, um, for, you know, for different types of oaks and also for um, ungulates uh, need, you know, open meadows for various parts of their life cycle. So for example, the removal of that central and historical um, landscape process like fire has completely shifted the ecosystems that Kadoop people historically have relied on. And now they've been fighting for many years to restore you know, their ability to burn traditionally like they did in order to maintain those ecosystems and those fire adapted species. Um, so for that, you know, like we went pretty, you know, we went all out on a lot of these species and, but it was like a more comprehensive document. It's not like a peer reviewed journal, right? We did a species profile for like 
20 different species at various elevation gradients and why they were in deep need of restoration of fire. Um, and so that, you know, and those species profiles very much reflect what I'm talking about here, right? Like in the profile, we mentioned the history of the species and its relationship to the tribe. What kind of lessons it teaches the tribe, right? It's this completely different dimension to what, you know, say like a Western land management, um, you know, what Western scientists are often confined to talking about in an objective way and can't really, it was really interesting in my class because I had quite a few people from the Department of Natural Resources students, graduate students, and they were like, I have felt, you know, a really interesting thing was that they felt liberated in my class that they could actually like express love for the species that they spend their whole life studying, right? But when they're scientists, they have to pretend that it's like, you know, this objective facade, right? Not for the Kaduk, right? Like the Kaduk Department of Natural Resources director like talks about Poof Poof, which is the giant Pacific salamander with like deep and profound love and it is not contested, right? Like that is just part of the job. Um, and so, you know, that was a really good example. But anyway, long story short, like in, it's, it's hard to like think about an ecosystem and think about what are the central species and relationships you want to focus on. And maybe for a given project, you focus on only a couple and that's okay. Like you don't have to bite off the whole cookie, right? You, even if you focus on a couple central relationships or like species or community issues or wounds, like I think that's already a great start. that is new to me and I was curious if you could talk about its history or like where it comes from. I think I really love it. I assume it only means like non-human species, but you were saying more than human often and I was curious just like the history of that, where that comes from and like more specifically what it means. Yeah, I mean it's kind of like a somewhat radical term that emerges from like, um, you know, when we think of, of binaries and we think of like human and non-human, like Non-human is kind of like, is you know, some some theorists and some like activists think of it as like, well, you're it like inherently kind of carries this like lesser than. So I think as a you know, in a way to like mitigate that, but also not have to list off like every species in the world. Right? <laughs> like you say more than human, kind of like beyond the human realm, but like not in like an inferior way. Yeah, and I can't like I don't know the exact genealogy of the term but I'm sure you could find, because it's like a fairly recent thing, um, but it, it's getting utilized increasingly, and it's certainly utilized a lot by indigenous scholars. Um, yeah, thank you. It's not mine, but I'm glad you, it made you happy <laughs> and not, you know, angry. Um, I am gonna hop in here real quick, and. I feel like the way you were talking about how we can utilize and apply these uh, frameworks into like our practice is a little bit more of a conversation similar to like hostile architecture. Like that's what I, that's what it reminds me of is like not putting bumps on benches and like thinking about that kind of stuff from like a, a form side of things. And I feel like this is really blowing that up. It's like 2.0, like 5.0, right? Like we're really expanding that scale into a variety of dimensions. And um, I just think that's really provocative. Um, I guess there's not a question in there. I just wanted Thank to you. point that out. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so up in like on the Columbia River, they have these great big dams that provide electricity. And every couple of years, there's these legal battles with the native tribes along there to, to blow them up. And they've been there, they've been there so long. And so I guess my question is if you were in this field of study where you have these species that have adapted to living with the dams that way for the most part, and you have these dams that provide water and irrigation to a lot of farmland and, and feed a lot of people, but then you also have the interests of the native Americans. I mean, who wins out in that situation where yeah, they're so crucial? That's a great question, right? And there's definitely, right now on the Klamath River, which is the river that the Kaduk are situated on, there is actually four dams being decommissioned um, after many, many tribal um, and environmental fights, right? Like decades worth. And it's not a win for everybody, right? Um, but in terms of like the restoring the salmon runs in that river, it's a win. And those are, that is like central to the community in terms of 
that's like a primary food source that um, gets dried for the winter and is like, you know, um, central to Kaduk identity. But those, that's a really important question, right? Because it's not just, because um, there are in every community and you will find that even when you're designing like a city park, right? You might have users coming with different backgrounds, uh, different interests that sometimes are conflicting. And there's no, I can't say to you like, oh yes, take the dams down or don't, right? Like this is something that um, ideally would be resolved through some sort of like um, in-depth conversation between policymakers, designers, uh, you know, ecosystem managers and the various communities at play. And because multi-species justice encompasses, you know, thinks about human welfare as well, right? And the farmer has welfare to, con to be considered as well, right? It's not like the farmer... Uh, is off the charts in terms of the considerations of multi-species justice. And that's what's kind of neat, is that you can take into consideration the welfare and livelihoods, you know, and needs of different communities and kind of think about, okay, well, are there some compromises that can be reached here? And what is the, like, you know, what are the, the, the main purposes and intentions of this project? And how can we make it so that there is some sort of maybe transformative justice, right, that... Um, Create some sort of compromise, or um, thinks about ways that policy can can uh, make up for maybe impacts that are going to negatively impact some of the communities in some ways and benefit others. Right. So it's it's complicated. It's not simple, and there's no right or wrong answer. And part of it is, you know, on what side of the fence do you stand? Right. And I'm sure the farmer would be like, no, we need this. So, and maybe the tribal member would be no, like we need this. I will say that in terms of like for tribes in particular, they do have legally mandated treaty rights. So they have, you know, in exchange for all the land that was taken, they, some tribes negotiated to retain access to certain resources. So tribes um, that have that legal power can demand that the federal government ensure that they continue to have access as was, you know, declared in their treaty to say salmon or, you know, deer or whatever, like every tribe has, you know, some tribes don't have this, but a lot of them do and can then, you know, have a legal, um, have legal standing in that regard because of the unique conditions under which um, they have this government to government relationship with the federal government. So in that case, there are, um, you know, some legal mandates that uh, encourage the government to take tribal interests into consideration. And that's not always the case, clearly. But so, yeah, there's no I don't have a, a true answer because it's all very context dependent. And there might be some, you know, there, there, there's net like I mentioned, justice is not some perfect solution. And oftentimes it's not perfectly applied. Right. And so it's understanding how can you have the most wins for the most people and communities and ecosystems with, you know, causing the least amount of damage onto anyone, regardless of their, you know, social standing or social location. Awesome. Yeah, we're going to wrap up this conversation down here and we'll continue it upstairs. So if you have questions, please come back upstairs um, and meet us there. Um, if